offline. Okay, so you guys are all free. Okay. We're live now. <laughs> Woo! Good morning. Woo, Houston. Okay. Right. We are recording, and my book is upside down. Okay. Okay. Everybody, take a deep breath here. We are investigating uh, the mess that we are in. <laughs> And how we get out of it. Is it hot in here or is it me? Oh, that's hot in here. Oh, that helps everything. The fan is... Okay, fine. All right. We're on the original sin. We are on the book called You Are What You Hate, right? By Sarah Yehudi Schneider, amazing uh, Kabbalist in the old city of Jerusalem that I did have the uh, great opportunity of meeting. So we talked about the levels of sin of a person. And specifically, we're into the levels of sin of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Okay? This isn't running. Now it is. Okay. So we're talking in the You Are What You Hate book, and we're going to be beginning actually on page 87. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me to focus. Okay. Focus. Okay. 87. Three levels. This is amazing that a person sins. We discovered two last week. In other words, any time a person's going to fall over, there's like kind of three layers that happens, okay, that we talk about all the time, right? A person is never, God forbid, God forbid, God forbid, allowed to sin, okay? We learned that last week, and I keep having to reiterate it because there's many people who think, no, do it big time, and then you'll bring the redemption, okay? Because we have a phrase in Chazal, our rabbis of blessed memory bring down, Mashiach, the Messiah can't come, listen to this, he can only come in a generation that is all wicked or all righteous. Exactly. The eye roll. Can we get that eye roll again? That's did it. That was like a, an eight and a half eye roll. Let's get a number 10 from you. Eye roll. Oh, when's that going to happen? Right? All wicked or all righteous? Okay, when are we all going to get righteous? Yeah, so right. let's just get wicked. Okay. Anyway, so now that's, so it's never. Okay. Okay. Shh. Okay, folks, folks, let's focus. Let's focus. Okay. So there's three levels. One is that in the Garden of Eden, actually, it was an agenda of God that Adam should fall. It was a hidden agenda within the very words of God's instruction. Don't eat the tree, but if you eat it, you'll die. Right? So when you say that, but if you'll eat it, you'll die, you know, or when you'll eat it, you'll die, you're implying, you know, the words are not empty. The words of a righteous a person are never empty. And God always seeks to fulfill and hook up where that manifestation of those words. Righteous people, even if they say things on, in jest, that's why we have to be very careful with our mouths all the time. All the time. Very, very careful. So you have to be very careful with your mouth. Because when you say things like, oh, don't open your mouth to the Sutton. Right? Thank God it's not raining and all of a sudden, okay? Right? Thank God it looks like the lanes are empty. We can speed and then, woo, woo, the cops. Are, don't. You have to be careful with your mouth. Mouths are very, our mouths are very powerful. And so, all the more so, God's mouth is very powerful. When he says things, if you eat of it, you'll die. It implies you're going, hmm, there's an, an agenda there that you're going to, uh, you're going to eat of it. Okay? So, with that, that is the hidden agenda that God really was a setup in the Garden of Eden for Adam to fail, to eat. That's the, we call that the superconscious, super, super rational. He called it actually, her name was, sorry, she called it, uh, da, 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 let's get the light language here. Yeah, superconscious, superconscious motive. The other one was the ego gratification, that there's some things in us that we just have this lust, this inner drive to do things, and we just want now. And that comes from kind of like the ego sense of I need now, this is for me now, even though, let's say, we're, we're, we, 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 we go out of control, but we're conscious to some degree. That we discovered like last time. And now we're going to discover the rationale, which is the deepest thing. What was Adam thinking? Yeah, there's a song like that, right? You ever know that? You ever heard that song? No. Country, Country Western? Western. Yeah. What was I thinking? Yeah. He, 
he was with the girl and the dad came with a shotgun and he's <laughs> riding trying to escape with the truck and he's shooting what was i thinking you know how every wet country western has a it has a so, has a story what every country <laughs> What is this? What is okay, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> the dog, the 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 baby, and the and the and the flying saucer. Okay. <laughs> there are okay. The aliens. I don't know, whatever. You're right. Okay. There was a Saturday Night Live skit where they did that. Every single song was about a baby, an alien, and a flying saucer. Okay. And it was just one country western after another, and the beer, the beer, the shotgun, the baby. All right. In any case, what was the rationale behind? What were they thinking? What was Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? What, why did they come to the conclusion that they come to? But first, I gotta give you a story. Great story. There were two very holy brothers. And they were named as Reb Elimelech and Reb Zusha. Reb Elimelech and Zusha were two holy, the holiest of brothers. Two huge scholars. They were students of the Magid of Mezrich, who was a student of the Baal Shem Tov. And these two students were walking one day, and of course this whole subject of Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden came up, and he's, and Eli, Rabbi Eli Melech, I believe it was Eli, uh, Rabbi Eli Melech, who my wife is a descendant of, she said, he was like, gosh, if I was in the Garden of Eden, I would have definitely told Adam not to do it. You know, Don't do it, man. <laughs> and Rav Zusha says to him, are you kidding me, man? I was there, and I was like, go and do it. Do it. Okay? In other words, all of our cells. Neurons, okay? So there's this struggle going on. Don't do it, do it. Do it, don't do it. Right? And there's a lot of stories, and, and, and really, there's unbelievable depth in terms of, let's see, what happened. Okay? But let's investigate first the, the simple effect here. Okay. Oh, perfect timing. Baruch Hashem. Here, just hand uh, David and uh, and Susan. Thank you. So we're on page 87. Do you have it there? And those are extra. Those are extras in case someone walks in. Like Jane usually comes in late. Thanks. All right. So we're on there. Page 87 says the story or rationale used to justify this thing. That's the third layer. Superconscious. Conscious kind of ego gratification, and then there's the rationale which we all get into. Oh, it's just one little chocolate tartufo can't hurt me, <laughs> okay? And then you just eat the whole box, and you're running out torch with the whole box under your arms, okay? Okay. <laughs> just one shot of whiskey, one drink, right? Rabbi Yitzchak Gloria explains. There she is. Perfect timing. Here you go. And save this for anybody else who comes in. Okay. All right. Ugh. All right. Rabbi Yitzhak Luria explains that Adam and Eve's eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil was not an act of rebellion or gluttony. Okay? It was a carefully considered and meticulously deliberated plan to serve God in the most meaningful way possible. Their intention was pure, though their deed was apparently mistaken. Okay? So what was their intention? How did they rationalize it? Because we always rationalize. And Hashem should save us, really, please, Hashem. Oh, to serve God with simplicity, right, is the ultimate, ultimate. You know, to be just simple. Just serve God. Just to be a simple Jew is, just, is the highest level. Just to be simple. Not complicated. So Reb Meir Simcha Cohen of Devinsk, he's uh, the Meshech Hachma. I forgot to bring my copy. Maybe there is here. I could look it up. The Meshech Hachma, in his commentary on the Torah, he reads chapter 3 of Genesis from the perspective of his encyclopedic knowledge of Jewish teachings, where even the most subtle hint reverberates in ever-winding circles of association. In other words, he's putting a lot of stuff together because he's got the entire span of all of the oral tradition and all of the written, written books. So he explains that Adam and Eve genuinely believed that Hashem secretly hoped they would take the fruit and eat it. They really believed that. They thought, he really wants us to. You know, come on, they all say this all the time. I'm using a very coarse metaphor, but when she says no, she really means yes. Okay? Okay? 
or all the time, and in anything, right? In any general thing. You know, you hid, hidden messages, people really, no, I don't want to date you again. Or, I don't want to see you again. That really means yes. So you keep pushing until she like throws the flower pot at your head and maybe, maybe you'll get the message. You shouldn't ask her again for coffee, okay? <laughs> What fo- so here, they, they genuinely believed Hashem secretly hoped that they would take the fruit and eat it. What follows is an elaborated pres- presentation of Rabbi Meir's, Rabbi, Rabbi Meir Simcha's ideas. Okay, so here, he, uh, he's going to bring just the basic gist uh, translation. And we're going to bring some others, okay? So here, here, here's his quote. In the Torah's lexicon of symbols, the tree of knowledge of good and evil denotes the complex world of relationships that are mediated by and dependent upon choice and options. Okay? When we look at it again, again, to recall, recap, everything, everything, everything. Why did God make a creation? Chevre. In order to have a relationship. Right? So, to have a real relationship. So the tree of knowledge denotes the complex world of relationships. And it, believe me, doesn't it get complex sometimes? The tree, listen, listen, listen. What he says here is just so great. Listen to this. The tree of affection would be its apt translation. Because we learned the tree of knowledge. Knowledge means connection. Dot is your ability to connect with either a piece of information or a person. You know what they know. You, feel, you know that person. When you know something, it's almost like your second nature when you know it. Right? If you know how to play an instrument, you know it. It's like it's second nature to you as opposed to learning or it's like an outside wisdom. Right? But when you know math or you'll know science or you'll know, it becomes integrated into the person. You're intimate with it. You have intimate knowledge. So really... The tree of knowledge of good and evil is the tree of relationship. It's the tree of intimacy, right? It's the tree of how, she, how he says it, affection. Affection. Can you believe it? Because it's the ultimate relationship. Yeah, I don't know. Well, wow, what do you mean? You know? Dot means knowledge because it says in the verse, Adam knew Eve, his wife. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she bore a son. So Adam knew Eve's wife means implies intimacy. Knowledge implies intimacy. Knowledge implies connection. So the decision of whether to eat from its fruit was, for Adam and Eve, a question of which path to produce the greatest possible closeness to God. Okay? So the idea they knew. Okay, it's going to say here. The serpent, here comes the Nachash, the serpent, caused them to doubt the simple assumption that if Hashem commanded them not to eat, he really wanted them not to do so. Okay, he caused them to doubt that fact. The serpent argued that the opposite was true. Hashem actually wanted them to take initiative. You got to be the boss. You got to own it, right? You got to make the move. Think it through and realize that the most spiritually productive in God's serving path was to partake of the fruit. He convinced them that this was the ultimate step in your spiritual development. And this is what God really wants you to do. And he left a space for you to do it. Okay? <laughs> Reb Zush is going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Reb Eli Malach is going, no, no. <laughs> Wouldn't that be the ultimate expression of love and sacrifice of devotion unto death? Here's where it comes. Mesiris nefesh, we say in Hebrew. Mesiris nefesh means handing over your soul. And if you really love someone, you got to be willing to just give up. You got to be willing to give up. David, are you willing to give up? You give up so much, don't you? you your wife drags you here. Come on, Susan. You got to give him credit. You got to give him, cut him a break. You got to give him some credit, okay? Okay. So, okay. So here, wouldn't that be the ultimate expression of love and sacrifice, of devotion unto death? Such a dramatic act of martyrdom would be a win-win. This is what the serpent was saying. It's a win-win, guy. 
The impact of their willingness to give up everything for Hashem, including their life, would reveal the glory of God in a way that nothing else could. It's the ultimate. By knowing good and evil, they would become godlike. That's what exactly the serpent said. You see, the serpent said, Oh, when you eat from that tree, then you'll be, then you'll be as God, knowing good and evil. Then you'll be as God. And we know that the ultimate degree of connection, okay? In other words, the more, it's just, just like if you take a bottle and you put oil and water together in the bottle, what's going to happen? And you shake up the bottle. Of course it'll separate the oil, even though it's on the bottom, it always will float to the top. Like seeks like. Birds of a feather flock together, right? So when a person behaves in a godlike way, he connects to the godlike Part of himself, he connects to God. But one thing is missing. What? One thing is missing in this equation. What is that? The Nicholas Shemaim. What? Oh, well, that's where we get to add. Yes. Okay, you're right. Not throw the whole thing off. Of course. <laughs> but here he's the, the serpent is saying, "You understand. You have to understand. You're not godlike now. You have to be godlike, and you're missing something. You're missing the godlike ability to know good and evil. You're missing that." So we, and, 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 and therefore, you, you, you have a sliver of disconnect. Mm -hmm. You have to really connect. And the only way to do that is to eat from there. And then you'll really connect. That'll be the ultimate connection. Win-win. Don't I sound so sweet to you? And that's what Arif and Ravid did, by mistake. Yes. They had better intentions. But All of them trying. By knowing good and evil, they would become godlike. And the principle is that on the inner planes, similarity produces closeness. Like, we call it uh, Hashvat Hatsura in Hebrew, which means equation of form. Like things of like form at attach. Like if I like and hate, right? Rockets, chocolate ice cream, I love, and M&Ms, okay? Also chocolate, okay? And you, to the degree, if you like the same, the same things, will be the degree of attachment. And if I like this, this, and this, and you hate, and I hate this, this, and that, and the degree that I like and hate, the same things will be our degree of attachment, okay? So if I, like, if I love everything God loves, and I hate everything God hates, will be a greater degree of attachment, okay? Everything's about equation of form. And that's why we, the Torah is constantly, constantly, that's why 613 instructions all to get us to that equation of form. You have to be God-like. You have to think of the other person. Okay? Every single thing is about not thinking of your egotistical, self-centered, beast-like self. You have to get out of the box, right? That's my Rosh Hashiva. I got those words from my Rosh Hashiva. <laughs> this guy, he's an egotistical, self-centered beast. <laughs> No, sorry, egotistical, selfish, self-centered beast with a Brooklyn accent, okay? <laughs> finally, finally, their death would release their souls to ascend back to their root and reunite with their beloved maker and thereby consummate their union. To die is a good thing, okay? Maybe today is a good day to die. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is what the serpent is saying. It's the ultimate union. It's the ultimate connection. How can you be missing? You're missing out. If you don't catch the deal in the next five minutes, it's going to go up in price five times. You've got five minutes to sign on this deal. <laughs> three minutes. Otherwise, we're out of here. The price is going up three times. Eating from the tree of affection. The tree of affection. Gewalt, gewalt. Eating from the tree of affection would fulfill the ultimate purpose of creation. Which would, which was to actualize the potential of relationship up to the greatest degree, degree, poss degree possible. We're here to have a relationship with God. Okay? And we're here, and God doesn't think small. He created us to have a relationship with Him. 
And of course, he wants the highest degree possible of relationship. Every single thing of our lives is only about relationship. Okay? Thank God, Baruch Hashem, Rabbi Nachman, right? And all of the sages before him, from Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, they all were involved in having private alone time with God and just talking. Because why? God wants a relationship. And of course, all the yeah, air, yeah, you look puzzled. Well, it seems to me that what he's saying is like opposite of what you would believe. Why? By sinning, you're going to have a, a, you, you would have the best possible... Well, relationship. because you'll die and your soul will go up and connect. And, and then and the other thing well, was... Did what? They didn't die. They, he said, well, the literal words were the day you'll eat of it, you'll die. So that was actually a debate in heaven after he had sinned. The angels go, day's ending, it's time to die. And God said, it was my day, white man. Okay? I don't know what that means. God says, it was one of my days, not your days. Angels, you guys got earth days? I'm talking about like angelic, my days, not angelic days. That's a thousand years. My, sorry, day of God is called, is he, he is a thousand years. Okay? Day, a, day, a day of God is a thousand years. Adam was supposed to live to a thousand years. He died actually at 930 years because he gave 70 years of his life for King David. Because he saw all of his generations. This guy was this. Don't forget, all of the future generations, he saw even you being born. Where were you born? Indiana? What, Philadelphia? Yes, he saw you being born in Indiana. Me. Yeah, and your entire life. He saw the whole bit, right? And I think he was pretty impressed, actually. So you're saying that he gave 70 of his years to King And he saw King David. King David was supposed to be a stillborn. He was supposed to be dead when he was born. He was not supposed to live. And he said, but, but and, 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 and Adam saw if this guy would live at this time, with this setup, in this situation, it would be the, the, the astronomical. It would be, it would be unbelievable. So he said, take 70 years, give it to this guy so he can live. And so that's why the soul, that's, we, we say Adam is Aleph, Dalit, and Mem. Aleph is Adam. The Dalit is David, and Mem is Mashiach. Aleph, Dalit, and Mem spell Adam. So the soul, it's really this power of soul, all-encompassing kind of soul. It's kind of a soul which is all-encompassing. That like he can, like it, this guy can connect with everybody. You ever meet people where you just like, you know... People, this guy connects with everybody, right? So, so like, there's a tzaddik like that. Everybody. So David was like one of those. Everybody connects with David, right? Except for Achitof, though. Okay, a little bit of a right, a little bit of a friction. And Shaul, okay, well, yeah, he had his own issues. And then there was okay, Av Shalom, and then there was yeah, yeah. Uh, this guy. Okay, anyways, but doesn't matter. You understand? He was his soul. What what he brought to the world was you, you can't even you, you imagine. He composed the whole the, the book of Tehillim. He put it together. What he did for he, he united a kingdom, and then he gave over the kingdom to King Solomon, and that was the golden era of Judaism, which lasted I don't know about seven and a half or eight years, where there was uh, there was a full, it was always a full moon. That's how Hazal says. I don't know how, but that's how the Kabbalists say it was always a full moon in Solomon's reign. It was called the golden era of Judaism, because why? I mean, he solved all the world's problems. There was no calamities. There was no hurricanes. There was no floods in the entire world. No diseases. No Everybody was like, unbelievable. The stocks were high. Everybody was living great. No diseases. No diseases. No need for hospitals. No need to raise money for hospitals. He was an unbelievable, awesome guy. Everybody wanted to be Jewish. Yes, that's right. You can go into your Walmart. The entire shelf was covered with tzitzis, kippahs, and sidurim. And then everybody wanted to be Jewish. Because it was like, whoa. It was like an unbelievable impression on the world. Okay, but of course, things have to happen, right? That was like the best years of, 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 of the entire Jewish history of Judaism. Because otherwise, outside of that, before and after, it was never a good day. Never. Never a good day. About seven and a half, seven, seven, maybe eight. I can, you know, he, he took on the kingdom, I think he was 15 when he took over. Yeah, and then he started doing, you know, with the wives business, you know, and he had to charge a lot of taxes. All kind of stuff went down. He yeah, we have shit. You need like a thousand shopping malls, one for each one. And a, and a credit card for each one. Okay. I have to go shopping today. I need things, I have to go shopping. 
So I have to go shopping. Where's my card? Where's my cash? I need cash. And there's a whole line. <laughs> Calm down. Calm down. Okay. <laughs> if I had my bag here, if I have it. I have to go shopping. Okay, uh, okay no, fine. No, I think he's All right, let's go. All right. Did I answer your question? No. No, I didn't answer your question. What was your question? <laughs> what? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's my that's my ultimate diversion. You know, the Trump, they're going to hire me to do that diversion in politics. Yes, yes, yes. Let's talk about this, the full moon. Okay, fine. All right. Okay, the idea really was uh, the aspect of being like God, connecting to God, including death. The day that you eat from it, you'll die. That was your question. So that it was God's day, not angels' day or, or earth day. Okay, that was a debate in heaven because the angel said he's got to die today, and God said it was, I was I was referring to my day. That was what I had in mind, and they went and the angels went sure, <laughs> right? Okay. In any case, uh, so therefore Adam was going to live a thousand years. Okay, but still death was part of that thing. I don't know what Adam was thinking when it says the day you eat from it you'll die, and according to this, it seems like he understands he will die, and that part of dying. Is some is an innate ability of our godlike soul that just wants to be connected to God. Like you shake up that bottle with the oil and the water, the oil just wants to float. There is this natural inclination that is within us, and it comes out at certain times, certain times of inspiration, certain moments. Shabbat, it comes out. Holidays, it comes out, or maybe even in between. Some times it'll come out where just you know, oh, only you, uh, only you. And nothing else really matters except your relationship with God. If he didn't eat from if he didn't eat from that tree, does that mean that he would have never died? That's right. He would never. None of us he was supposed to live forever. The none of us would be here. Well, we kind of would, but we would have been like angelic souls. We'd just be souls. Yeah, and it wouldn't be much of a relationship. So no yet tomorrow, no struggles, yeah. no choices. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, it would have been. And and I guess from our perspective, I guess we would think that would be boring. Right, but I mean, I guess not. <laughs> Can't say that. Yeah, everybody. No, and then we're supposed to be like that. We're supposed to live forever. So there was a hidden agenda that for God to yeah to trip it up to make sure that He does it. There was this hidden agenda, okay. But still, we have to just understand what was Adam's rationale. How was the serpent enticing Adam to go ahead and it makes sense? It's a business plan. It's a win-win. Can't lose. You get to cling to God. It's the ultimate attachment. Right? You'll be like God, and you'll die. And you'll be attached. Ultimate relationship. You can't lose. Right? And it made sense. And now I'm going to explain some other things that make sense. Okay? In a, in a second. Okay? 89. The top of 89. So Adam inferred that since the whole point of his existence was to perfect his relationship with God, and since this consummate union requi- 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 requires that one demonstrate its supreme importance by a readiness to die for it. Okay, that's the ultimate self-sacrifice, everything for you, right? He concluded at the serpent's prompting that secretly this was, this is exactly what God wanted from him. Hashem warned Adam that the tree would bring death. Yet he hoped that Adam would find the courage to offer himself in this ultimate gesture of love. Okay? Again, that last line. Hashem warned Adam that the tree would bring death, yet he hoped that Adam would find the courage to offer himself in this ultimate gesture of love. In other words, he felt it was the ultimate gesture of love to go ahead and eat from that tree of knowledge. He was convinced. Now, I'm going to give you a... That, this, is, this is the Meshech Chachma's uh, uh, interpretation, uh, idea of the rationale behind it. I'm going to give you a little bit of another kind of a rationale. Okay? But this is his rationale. Basically, you eat from that, it's really God's real inner will for you to eat from that. He left a space for you. And therefore, you have to initiate the relationship because that's what it's all about, you initiating. Yeah, that makes sense. And then you get to attach yourself to God because really the ultimate attachment is if you're willing to die for God. So therefore, it's a great 
situation. There's other kinds of little angles. I'm only going to give you two others, but there's many, many commentaries who go into very, very big detail in terms of what was the rationale. But this has other rationale, and they kind of like all complement each other, okay? The, the, the ultimate, the most recent one that I saw from the Maharal of Prague uh, mentioned this to a certain degree. I don't know if it fits, but let, let me just talk it out and we'll see if it fits, okay? And, I, and I, I mentioned this before, was that, you know, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were called Tom. Tom, tough mem. Tough mem means whole in Hebrew. There's a verse in the Torah, there's a mitzvah. Tamim tiye im Hashem elokecha. Whole, wholehearted, whole, with wholeness you will be with God. And what do they translate? Rashi understands that simply as, you know, don't start looking into astrology, to the future. We don't need to delve into what's going to be, right? We just, God runs the world and just go simple. Not complicated, not sophisticated. We have the four sons. You remember the four sons in the in Passover Seder, right? They have the, they have the, the, the Chacham, they have the Rasha, you have the Tom, and you have the Enu Yodeli Shol. The, the Chacham is the wise man, right? The wise son. The Hasidic masters don't really look up to that guy, okay? You know, he's a Chuchm. Chuchm means like a smart aleck. Yes, he's got wit, but he's not so impressed. Okay, so he knows a lot. So he's got a, a genius mind. So what? What does he do with it? And then there's, of course, the wicked. And then there's the Tom. The Tom is the simple. The Tom is the ultimate uh, relationship. Tamim tiyeh ma'ashem alakecha. Tom, you should be... Don't get complicated. Don't get too sophisticated. Have you ever met people who are very sophisticated and they don't move in life? I know a guy who couldn't... He, he was like a really rich guy. But he couldn't get internet because he couldn't decide which internet to get. Is it better AT&T or this one or that one? And meanwhile, years would, years, years would go by because he couldn't decide which internet to get in his house. He was so complicated thinking about which is the better deal. So therefore, you don't move because you're just still figuring it out. So busy figuring it out. Okay? Not supposed to be so busy. Just move forward. Go simple. Okay? So Tom is really... Uh, um, how Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. They were whole. They didn't need anything. They weren't lacking. Comes the serpent, and he says, you know, you guys, all these trees you can't eat? No, 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 no. We can eat all of them except that one. Right? That was the one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we can't eat. And he says, oh, God, you know why? It's because if you eat like that, then you'll be as God, which means you're not like God now. You're not God like now. If you eat from that, then you'll be like God. Uh huh. Meaning, you're lacking now. He convinced them of an idea, an idea of lack. That's a huge thing. Have this is so big, okay? Because it's we, it bleeds into our lives right now. The idea, the concept of lack, and it goes into so much areas. Not that only just I don't have enough money in my bank account. Okay? I don't have enough wits. I don't have enough smarts. I don't have enough love. I don't have enough. I don't have, I don't have what it takes to fulfill my life's purpose. Uh -huh. I don't have what it takes right, to follow my destiny. That is the biggest. Okay? Once Adam and Eve were convinced of that, you're lacking? Oh, we're lacking? We're lacking. Like they're looking at each other, dude, we don't want to, we're lacking. <laughs> right? So, of course, they're going to eat from it because they want to fill that lack, right? And that, that's where the whole snowball effect came. Once they bought into the idea, the concept of lack, that became the reality and the reality of all mankind from then on. We are creatures that lack, and, that we're, and therefore we have to go ahead and come on to God to fill that lack. And therefore, Baruch Hashem, thank God we have brachas, blessings we have to say, where we actually bring down that lack and we have to say after blessings. There's two unbelievable blessings that we say, right, that imply it. Okay, I need a sitter. No, okay. Uh, is that a standard sitter? No, no, I need a big one. I need a bit of, that's a perfect, give me the art scroll. Yeah, 
Yeah. It'll help me. This is just a tiny arch. Perfect. Okay, fine. Just hang on with me, folks. Hang on with me. Okay, first there's. Okay, so any, let's just. So the first, by the fact that Adam and Eve bought into the idea of lack, they have to live out their lives with overcoming the idea of lack. Yeah. Okay, so. It's the biggest challenge of everybody. So yeah. Yes, they were. They were completing on the mental plane of reality. And if, if we were, they were not to sin, we would also be on the mental plane of reality. We would be thoughts. We would be thought forms. You know, like in the Star Trek where there's like thought to form. Like energy, right? Yeah. If you're that way, do you have cognitive... Absolutely. There is an element of, 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 of will to receive there, but it's, so, it's totally purified. It's a total purified vessel that that is able to just reflect God's infinite light and that is the our potential and in a certain sense our souls are already like that right now in a certain spiritual realm so they had to have they had to sin before they could have children no they would Even have children souls can in that realm, I'm not going to get complicated. I don't, you know, it's a good question you're asking. And I never really read what they would, and I, but I did read they would be able to have kids. Listen, there's, God, there's nothing God can't do. So he can make thought forms, these entities, spiritual entities have kids. Okay? Demons have kids. What's a demon? Then every one of us would be just like a. Yeah, and, and you are in a certain sense right now. But Rabbi, since. You, yeah. 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 Well, we have bodies. well, now we have bodies because that body is part of our rectification. Our whole relationship with this whole body form is part of our process. We are all in a process. I hate to use the word, okay? But it, it's a great word because it's, it means you're going through a kind of a, of, of a, of a, of a growth. You have to go through a, a certain process in a, to reach completion. Yeah. And it'll be better. It'll be better. Because it'll be real. And you would have earned it. But, Rabbi, there's... Yeah. Hashem knew that this was all going to happen. So this whole thing about, you know, them being, Adam and Eve being convinced and all that stuff, I mean, it doesn't, in a way, it doesn't make... I mean, it doesn't... Because this was a setup. God knew it was all going to happen this way. He set it up like this. Yes. But we have to get into, right now we're just trying to figure out what was the rationale of Adam. Because that rationale still affects us right now. Okay. Yes. But so we have to go ahead and be able to differentiate between that rationale and, and, the, real, and the real right thing to do. Okay. Because we're, we get caught up in rationalizations all day long. I kid you not. You know that. And you got to know, understand, is that a rationale or not? If you can only catch yourself, but because, no, you're too busy rationalizing why it's good. Because your ego is going, no. And then your super conscious is going, yeah, it's a good idea, right? You need to do it, right? So, which you're not even aware of those levels, but it's still operating inside of you. Just some, your animal soul is already in an operating mode. You already go out of your mind. You're already, your soul is already, a part of your intellect has already left you. And you're already like, no. So for all this chachma, wisdom, yeah, is just generating ego and arrogance and anything but self nullification. Yes, and, yes. And lack. Yes, and that and that's the part that really needs fixing, and that's the part why we're here. And I'll get to that. So, and that when I under when I explain the second part, then I'll explain the third thing that goes into what Jane is is getting into. So this all ties into the whole bread of shame thing. So this is the Perfect. way that Hashem set Perfect. up. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Right. Yes. So that we would get it. You're saying good. Okay. So now all let's right. get let's get we'll back. Let's just get back to here. Okay. So there's two blessings that we do say. So in other words, once they bought into the idea of lack, yeah. mm -hmm. and they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, so they're all for they became that idea, and therefore they have to live their lives out of this experience, be it real or not, of lack, okay? Mm -hmm. That now we have to come on to God. Well, we always had to come on to God. We always had to recognize God as the source, but now it's a little bit, it's a step removed, okay? 
as opposed to before we sin, we were totally connected to the source. We were totally understanding he was our source. There was never a question about it. Everything was just, you know, God just giving in, in the most unbelievable way in the Garden of Eden. There was no questions. Now we're in where there's questions because we have to fight other forces, other influences that either distract us or convince us to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. So there's two blessings that we do say, which are really powerful blessings. Okay, the first blessing that we do say after we say a blessing, let's say after you eat a, um, an olive size of a food item that is not either tree verse real or bread or wine, right? Let's say you ate a, um, an apple. Okay, the garden of, tree of the Garden of Eden was not an apple, by the way. Okay, so let's say you ate a whole apple. You have to say an after blessing. You know what the after blessing is? It's a fantastic after blessing. Really, it's my goal. Please, Hashem. My whole year has been like, did I say that after blessing? Sometimes I don't even remember saying it. And now I have special intention to say it with Kavana. And it says, Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, right? Baruchat Hashem, Lekinu Melech Olam. Borei Nefashos Rabos V'Chesronan. You created multiple souls and what they lack. Borei Nefashos Rabos V'Chesronan. And what they lack. Okay? Al Koma Shibarasa, every single thing you have created. Al Koma Shibarasa, the Hachayos Behem Nefesh Kochai, to make every single living thing live. Baruch Chay Olamim, blessed is the life of all worlds. That's the blessing we say after a standard food, not a bread, not a wine, not a, a, a fruit of Israel. Standard other food, not cake, right? Cake is a different blessing. But basically, this standard blessing implies you created many things and what they lack, and you fill it. You fill it. Okay? And then the other thing is really this powerful blessing, which I read it for the first time. It hit me this year when we went out of the synagogue and said it on, on Shabbat in the, in the synagogue. It says, oh, Such a powerful blessing, and you only get to say it once a year. The, the, this is upon fruit trees in bloom during the spring. You have to go to a, a, a tree in the springtime, that is blooming, a fruit tree, right? Before, when it just blooms, and it will be a fruit, but it's not a fruit now. Springtime. And you say, Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, for, for nothing is lacking in His universe. And He created it, He created in it good creatures and good trees to cause mankind pleasure with them. But here's the idea, the concept here of, for nothing is lacking. Shalokhi said, but Olomo there's nothing lacking. You gotta creep it in, back into our headspace. The idea of can there be anything lacking if I am connected to God? And the answer is no. It says Tamim Tiye Im Hashem Elokecha. This is what the Barditch of Rebbe says. Tamim Tiye, whole will you be when you're with God? Im Hashem Elokecha. That's the verse of the verse. Whole you will be with God. And that's a way to live when you're living connected. You are lacking nothing. And that's what we're always trying to do, to reconnect, reconnect. Because we get into a habit thinking we're not connected. Always. It creeps in. That's the serpent's thing. And the interesting thing is when you take the word Tom, Adam and Eve were Tom in the Garden of Eden. When you take the word Tom, the Hebrew words, and you switch it, it means mate, death. Okay? In other words, they were Tom. They messed up. Okay? It's unbelievable, huh? So, if, the Torah, if they didn't sin, the Torah would be a completely different Torah. It would have been a Torah. We would have gotten a Torah. It would have been a lot shorter. It would have been. I don't know. No, I doubt that. I, I doubt that. It would have had just different letters and different majors and different nuances. It would have maybe been straightforward. It would, might, might have been like a straight, just straight stuff. Just, just like, or whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, whatever. Okay. Sorry to go so vulgar. Okay. Of course. Sorry. Just whatever it was. Like, oh, whatever. Just like snort, but whatever. Drink, whatever. Okay. Sorry. Woo. Of course, Rabbi. It's because of you two. It's because of you two. It's all your fault. You guys drive me crazy. Yes, you and her. You bring it out of me. These people are mellow. I'm like more subdued today, but I'm not. Okay, anyways, let's, let's go back. 
The third view of the rationale. This is the third. It's okay, you guys. You know. You know. This is the third view of the rationale of Adam. What? No, I was loony before. <laughs> Uh, um, this is the rationale that hopefully will tie in all the things. And it was like what you were saying by the Nam de Kasufa. Go and check. Is the air on? Because I'm like smoking in here. That is bogus, man. I'm talking about the air conditioner. It never works. Okay, fine. Thank you. We're having a lot of trouble with this year. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, fine. I'm not that bad. Okay. I did. Let's get to this. Okay. We only have a few more minutes. So to tie into the whole idea of the Namana Kasufa, which is called the bread of shame principle, as we know that God made a creation in order to bestow pleasure, right? Oh, bless you. You can do the oscillating too. It's so fine if I just, we can share it. We can share. Okay. The idea really is God made a creation in order to bestow pleasure. Okay. And now that pleasure that God wants to give, of course, is himself. But of course, to give that pleasure... The ultimate pleasure, the ultimate relationship, right? Where the vessel, us, receiving that pleasure, to receive it in the right way where we will appreciate it and be able to hold it is that if we earn it. You have to earn the pleasure, right? A person who works and he earns it, it means much more to him than if he got it for free. Okay, a person who got it for free, he didn't work for it, it doesn't mean much as much. Okay? As opposed to a person who really worked a lot for it and he got it and he made and he worked on the business and the hot dog stand became a bank and then the bank became a you know, right? And it went up and up. Right? First he started off as a hot dog stand as a, when he was an immigrant and then you know it lost him. Now he's like Nathan's hot dogs all over. Right? So 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 the idea really is like, you know, you work for it. You know, and it means something means something to you, it has meaning, it's precious. So the idea really is to earn that level of preciousness, right? So the idea really is God had to, God had to make the situation where we were able to earn that preciousness, okay? So we now go into the Garden of Eden, and here's the dialogue between the serpent and, 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 and Adam and Eve, Chava, really. So he said, okay, so you can't eat from that tree, and all you have to do is just not eat from that tree? Okay. If you don't eat from that tree, so then you're going to get like a reward for it? Yeah, just from not eating that tree. How much reward are you going to get from not eating from that tree? Okay. He says, if you eat from the tree, you'll get more reward because you'll become addicted to the tree, tree addict. Okay? And then you'll overcome the addiction. Listen, you know, this is what he's telling. This is what he's telling her. He says, listen, man, a guy who never touched a drop of alcohol, and you put in front of him a bottle of, of tequila, and that's a vodka, which is really rancid stuff. <laughs> You're tempted now with this, aren't you? And you wave the bottle in front of him. The guy's like, no, I'm not tempted by it. It smells terrible, and I know it tastes terrible. Okay? So he's not tempted. Right? So how much reward are you getting from not partaking of it? And all you got to do is sit there with the bottle there. In the, you know. Uh, so if you drink and you become addicted and then you overcome the alcoholism, how much more of a reward from you overcoming? Lefum sara agra, we say. According to the effort is the reward. You are cheapening out on yourself. This is what the Nachash is saying. The serpent is saying. You're cheapening, cheapening out on yourself and you're cheapening out on God. Because now God is not able to express himself fully because you're going to only get a Dixie cup of reward when you can get a gallon or like a, a, a drum, a full drum. You're only going to be, you know, you're cheapening out on yourself and you're cheapening out on God. Because what? You're not even putting in any effort. There's no energy. You got to put in the energy. You got to sweat. You got to sweat for it. You got to fall into it and get out. You got to crawl in the hole and get out. And it sounds like a convincing argument because why? The more effort, the more the reward. It made sense. It made sense. So therefore, that's why they ate from it. Because why? Then we get to earn more. Because why? We, we came, became addicted to the tree and then we overcame. Problem is what happens 
Once you taste it, it holds you. Once you taste it, it holds you. And that's it. And, it's, and, and to get out of it, boy, you need a 12-step program. And you didn't have a 12-step <laughs> available in the Garden of Eden. No sponsors. What? They acted like God sent this nakash to help them understand what he wanted. Which is, no. Right. They weren't cons- the honest with you, listen, you're not the nakash. God's God. Ah, so that's why in the Garden of Eden that when he went, when God finally appeared on the scene, right? And he didn't appear, you know, it's a strange language. God was walking in the garden (laughs) in the heat of the, in the the middle of the day. It just, no, no, though they explained it, the commentaries explained just that the prophecy was coming now. In other words, they were starting to, the shade, the the layers of concealment that were now being removed. Okay, and and then and then what happened was when he came and he asked Adam, "Did you eat from the tree?" There's lots to talk about there. The dialogue that he had, right? Big huge thing there. Of course, what did he say? What was his first words? What was Adam? Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat? What did he say? Well, she told me to yeah, <laughs> your fault, God, because it was that woman that you gave me. It was that darn woman there with the shotgun and the truck and the a case of beer. She came with the case of beer. What am I supposed to do? Okay. She came with a case of beer. It was Bud Light. What's wrong with that? Okay. Really. So, so, um, so he, he was kafui tov. He denied the good, which is a huge thing. If Adam would have said right then and there, I sinned. I admit if he would have admitted his guilt right then on the spare, he would never have gotten kicked out of the Garden of Eden. If he would have admitted right then and there, I blew it. Accept responsibility. Big, huge thing. Huge thing. If he would have just accepted responsibility, he would never have gotten kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Would never have needed to do such a thing. Instead, nah. He blames it on the woman, right? He blames it on God. Okay. Yeah. Oh, we're still online, I think. Okay. Okay, I think so. That's okay. As long as you're you're not in there, nobody knows who you are. And let's get back because we only have two minutes, a few more minutes. Okay, now I forgot where I was. Okay, and then she went to Chava. He went to Chava and he says, "What did you do?" And he says, "Well, the Nachash told me to do it, right, right." And then he, the Nachash, he didn't even ask the Nachash. He did not let the Nachash speak. He just zapped him. Right? No arms and legs. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the serpent. Nachash is serpent. So he didn't even give the Nachash a chance to say anything because he knew what the Nachash would say and he would be right. The Nachash would say, if you have the words of the rabbi and the words of the student, who do you listen to? You listen to the words of the rabbi. You never, I'm the student of the rabbi. That's what the Nachash would say. Like, Rav, Divri Talmud, Misha, Minin. Well, no, it's like, what do you want me? I'm just, a, I'm just, a, I'm just a little guy. He didn't, they didn't have to listen to me. I'm just a little, the, the fellow student along with them in the garden. He got in the way of their relationship with God. Oh, what an interesting thing that you say. But God set and it up. he's still in the way. God didn't let him speak because God set it up, and maybe the snake would have no. said it. Okay, hey, so you got to do this, the do point it. here is there's three layers. Yes, it was a setup. Yeah. As, as, as right. hard as it is to say that, because I know some rabbis would beg, would say no way, but I know there's some texts which imply it explicitly. It was meant to be, because you know something? It happened! Right. right. If, it ha- if it didn't happen, that means right? That God is testing us every second in our connection to him. Because lots of people will come, even rabbis, will tell you this, this, and this, and we know in our, our heart the derech is supposed to be God. We, we, that little voice inside us tells us the answer, and then someone else can give you a different answer, and your insides know, no, that's not right. Ah, good thing that you say. So I'll end off with this, okay? That we know that we're, that the, we, Barati Yitzhara, Barati, Barati Yitzhara, Barati Torah Tavlin. I created the evil inclination, and I created the Torah as its spice. Remedy. We'll look at it simply for remedy. We're taught the entire Torah, Every person is taught the entire Torah when they're in the stomach of their mother. The angel comes and teaches the entire Torah. And then when they're born, the angel slaps the face and they forget the Torah. 
right? So they ask the question, right? What's that? What was the purpose of that? What was the purpose? Why well, teach the entire Torah, right? Yeah. Including a tour of Gan Eden and the and Gehenna, right? This way to your left is Gehenna. Watch your step, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so in any case, right? And to my right, right, is the capital of Austin. Notice the capital building. It is bigger than Washington. <laughs> okay, anyways. And anyways, so a tour, anyway, so why hit him and make him forget it? So the answer really is, of course, and they bring the parable up. When he's teaching the person, the, the entire Torah, in the stomach of their mother, it's like chiseling it in, in stone. And then when they're born and he slaps them and they forget, it's like just covering over with dust. So the, our whole idea of our whole lives is just to reveal the dust, is just to uncover, uncover the dust. But really, like what you're saying, the message is really within. Mm -hmm. The truth is really within, right? It's Interesting how he curses the Nachash from the dust you will eat. And that's that dust there that you just need to uncover because that is the thing that breaks our relationship with God. The message is there. You have to know it. You have to access it, okay? And you have to listen to that voice. But then again, you have other voices that go in your head like, no, but chocolate, no. no, no, no Rabbi, okay. This comes from here. This comes from here. Of course, the left ventricle, of course. Okay. All right. We're going to stop now. Any other questions? Now I finish this.